And that light just decides to come on when it wants to come on, doesn't it? <laughs> Last week, we were in Genesis chapter 18, and we noticed how that God came to Abraham, and Abraham treated him with respect and hospitality. And that really plays an important part in this sermon. And uh, we also noticed how that God told Abraham that He would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And thus we get into Genesis chapter 19, part 1. Yes, this chapter is a little bit of a long chapter, and so it's going to be part 1. Now next Sunday is going to be the first Sunday in August. And so we're going to pick up Genesis 19, part 2 then. But this is the last Sunday in July. The days and the weeks just keep passing by ever quickly. Genesis 19, part 1. And there came two angels, starting in verse 1, of course, it says that there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. And tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did make unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now the angels, they came to Sodom. Lot saw that he was sitting at the gate, probably his place of business, and he saw them. And when he saw them, he urged them to come and stay with him. And he, he knew how dangerous the streets of Sodom were. He urged them greatly. And they said, no, we, we'll just stay in the street tonight. And he's like, you really don't want to do that. He basically started begging with them. He pressed on them greatly. He begged them, come stay with me where it's safe. And so, they came to his house, they relented, they came to his house, and he prepared a feast for them. Now that's, that's very important to this chapter. Now in verse 4 it says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, passed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Now, we all know that the term to know someone in the biblical sense means to have sexual relations with them. But there are some arguments that are placed by various groups about Genesis 19, and we're going to look at some of those arguments and we are going to dispel them using facts and common sense. The first argument that people want to make to take homosexuality out of the Bible in Genesis 19, they say that God wanted to destroy, or God destroyed Sodom rather, not necessarily wanted to, but He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because they had a lack of hospitality. They quote or cite such passages as Ezekiel 16.49 that says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. 
pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Now, it is true that there, were, there was a game that the business owners would play on people, the strangers that would come into the gate. They would come in to the city, they would need, they would need provisions, and some would, and there would be like a money lender who would give them money, who would lend them money to go and get provisions and to make them some money to pay them back. But then nobody would sell to them. And as the person would die of starvation and thirst, then the money lenders and the people would go and they would take the money and disperse it amongst themselves. They made a game of it. No one is denying that they were inhospitable. No one is denying that they had pride, that they had fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. They did not strengthen the hand of the poor and of the needy. No one's denying that. It says it right here in Ezekiel. However, to claim that that is why God destroyed Sodom and leave out the homosexuality part is a gross mistranslation, or not mistranslation, but a gross negligent handling of the Scriptures. The next argument that they try to use, the second one that we're going to notice this morning, is that they try to say, oh, to know them means that they didn't like them because they were strangers. That they wanted to take them and interview them and get to know them to make sure that they were not spies for another nation or a threat to their city. This is complete hogwash. What we have here is Lot's house surrounded by the men of the city, both young and old from every part of town who were violent homosexuals who wanted to rape the angels that came to Lot's house. The evidence that we have that they were violent homosexuals and that it wasn't just a group of people, both men, you know, men and women, because it says men of the city. But then, notice, it says that they wanted to know them, and we're going to continue on in the Scriptures here, and Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. Now people say, how do you know that it was men and not women? I'll tell you why. we just keep going real quick. He said, and I pray you brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said, Again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now, we will, now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. We know that these were violent, homosexual men that were wanting to do this. Because here's the thing about it. When it comes to the homosexuals who are considered lesbians, they are they claim to be attracted to women. And Lot offered his daughters and they were rejected. This was men wanting what they perceived to be men. And they wanted to rape them. Now, 
we have to understand that to God, one sin is just as grave as another. There is nothing about homosexuality that is necessarily worse than murder. And it was the culmination of Sodom's sins. Their sin cup had gotten full. But to act like homosexuality never played a part in it, and that it was just inhospitality, pride, greed, that is to just completely ignore what the plain reading of Genesis 19 is. Of course, I'm not going to sit here and act like that, like that the homosexual aspect part was the sole reason why that God destroyed Sodom when there were other reasons as well. The sin was heaped upon sin. In fact, when you go back and look at Sodom's sins, they were very much like our own country. Homosexuality, pride, greed, murder, theft, adultery. You just just count off on the list. Sounds a lot like America today. Of course, now people want... And here's one thing about it. And brethren, I do not want to mislead anyone. I do not want to mislead anyone. Because there are people that will sit there and they will look at this passage and they'll say, oh, but homosexuals don't act that way. They're, they're full of love. They're full of peace. Tell that to the street preacher. And I saw this on video. I saw it online. It was on video. It was on YouTube. It was a street preacher who was preaching out against homosexuality and he was there at a gay pride parade and a group of homosexuals attacked him. They took his son, ripped it up, and they attacked him, beating on him. And I just thought in my mind when I saw that, Sodom. Sodom. Do not get it confused. Do not get it twisted. The homosexual movement in this country is not full of people that want to be left alone. They are violent and they will attempt to force their sin on other people through any means necessary. The only reason why that they're not breaking down our doors right now is because there is some semblance of law and order in this country. And that they know that we, if they did so, that we could call the police on them. And they, do, they also know that we have the right to keep and bear arms in this country and that if someone, if anyone tried to come in and murder or rape any one of my family, then I am not afraid to use force to stop them, to protect my family, to protect my wife, to protect my child, to protect my parents, to protect my friends and my loved ones. But do not get it twisted. There is a violent violent, forceful, aggressive nature to the homosexual movement in this country. And it is just like the land of Sodom. And as I do with every sermon regarding this, I am not advocating for anyone to go out and hurt anyone. I'm not advocating. I'm not pushing for that. I'm not, adding for, I'm not advocating for anyone to go out and murder anyone or to hurt anyone. It's counterproductive to what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to spread the information so that people can make informed decisions so that they can come to the Gospel and go to heaven. If someone is killed while they are in sin, it is detrimental to the cause of Christ. 
But if anybody thinks that I'm going to sit back and play nice and not tell the truth for the sake of political correctness, they got another thing coming. They thought wrong. But let's look and see what happened to Sodom here in Genesis 19. Verse 10, it says, But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. So the angels, they, they grabbed Lot. And these people, were they were, ready to be, they were ready to kill Lot. They were ready to kill him and break down his door to get to the angels. These men were. And they grabbed Lot, pulled him inside, closed the door. And what they did, what the angels did, they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. These men, these homosexuals were so filled with lust. They were so filled with lust that they wearied themselves to find the door after they had been struck blind. You have to be pretty depraved. If I know that if I was struck blind right now, the first thing I would be concerned about would be I'm blind. These men were struck blind and they're still trying to find their way inside. And people say, and I can hear people now saying, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It, 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 why would people act that way? Well, friends, brethren, I've got to tell you, I've seen a lot of things that don't make any sense. There is a, a professor that always gives his students the prisoner's dilemma, essentially. Where he says to where he has it on their finals that if you here's your chance to get extra credit. You can either get two points on your final grade or six points. But here's the catch. If you choose six points and enough of you choose six points, then nobody gets anything. But if you pick two points, you get the two points. And you know you can get the two points. There's no drawback to it. And common sense, you sit there and you look at it and common sense says well we should pick the two points and get the guaranteed two points rather than take a chance of not having anything. Common sense says that. But if common sense says that, why is it that it was like only once or twice out of all the years he's done this that the students ever got any points. It's because the prisoner's dilemma and the law of commons tells us that people tend to operate on short-sighted greed and are willing to betray others to get a perceived gain in the short term rather than the long term. It breaks all common sense. Now, I'm not going to go off chasing rabbits. The point I'm trying to make is there are the things that people will do that won't make any common sense. It doesn't make any common sense that these men, after being struck blind, were still trying to find their way inside to rape these angels. But guess what? They were doing it. They were doing it. And if anybody says, oh, you sound so passionate about this, it's because it's, it, it's regardless of whether that anyone believes that it happened, it happened. These are not stories from a fairy tale book. These are real accounts with real people. There really was a place... <coughs> excuse me. There really was a place called Sodom. There really was a man called Lot. Two angels did come to his house and there were violent homosexuals that did try to break down the door to rape them. It's a real event. It happened. It's history. Believe it or not, 
it's real. It happened. Whether it makes any sense or not, it happened. Says in the men in verse twelve, and the men said unto Lot, Haste thou here, or hast thou, excuse me, hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. You have to remember that. God couldn't even find ten righteous people in this city. And in, in this little country, basically, is what it was. In this city-state, this kingdom, God couldn't even find ten righteous people. He was going to bring this country down. And the angels told Lot, get you, your family, your belongings, whatever you need to carry to get by, and you get out of town. Because this, because God's going to destroy Sodom. He's going to destroy this city. And then in verse 14 it says, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. You know, this is this is really sad. I mean, this is making me want to, to cry right now. Because you have to remember, just a handful of chapters ago, we were in the days of Noah. And he begged and pleaded with those people, with everyone around him. And he told them, the Lord is going to destroy the earth. He's going to destroy it with water. He preached unto them to repent and they mocked Him. And the only ones that believed Him, His wife, His sons, and His daughters-in-law. And then here's Lot. He's telling the people. He's warning them. He doesn't even necessarily warn all the people, but He goes to His own family, His own sons-in-law. And He tells them. He's begging with them. Listen, we got to get out of town because this this thing this place is going to go up, and they wanted to mock him. They wanted to mock him. You know, it, it, it's really interesting because here's his sons-in-law that they see have... Notice, they weren't there with all the homosexuals trying to break down the door. But they can't sit there and say that they don't see how rotten from the inside out that Sodom had gotten. But they still wanted to live with those blinders on Verse 15, when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Um, before we get too much further, what's really sad, and this reminds me so much of the New Testament, is here are the angels. Okay, Lot goes to his sons in law. And he, and I'm sure he didn't just say, "Hey, we got to get out of town." I'm sure he told them when they didn't believe at first. I'm sure he tried to reason with them and say, "Listen, there's some angels at my house. These homosexuals tried to bust down the door to rape them, and they struck every single one of them blind. You don't believe me? Come to my house and check it out." And it reminds me so much of the New Testament where the Pharisees, they saw the miracles. They saw the miracles right then and there in front of their face. And they still sat back and said, 
It's of the devil. That is what that that is what just really makes me want to cry. It makes me want to cry because people talk about doing what's in their best interest, but mankind has you can jot this down as one of the little sayings that I'm probably gonna have from here on out. That mankind has a pretty sorry track record of doing what's in their best interest, especially when it comes to getting to heaven. You want scripture to back it up? Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Then in verse 16 he says, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it, they, so they took him outside the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in, in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. They were told to keep running and to just get out of town and keep going. Get to the mountains. Don't even stay in the plain lest you get lest, <coughs> lest you're gonna die. And what's really important is they told. They told them. They told Lot, they told his wife, they told us who his two daughters to not look back. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Verse 18. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee into it, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. He said unto them, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. Now Lot was obviously old by this point. And he was concerned that if he was in the mountains in the wilderness, something would happen to him. Maybe a wild animal would get him or something. And so he begged to go to the much smaller town of Zoar. And God allowed him to do it. And the sun was risen upon the earth, verse 23, when Lot entered into Zoar, and the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. I remember a sermon that my uncle Jimmy preached a while back at the uh, now closed down Whiteville congregation, where that he made the statement that. Sodom and Gomorrah were so dis were destroyed so thoroughly for their sin that they could that they couldn't even find relics from those cities, and that's actually true. And so many people would try to mock the Bible to say, "Well, we we can't find any trace of any Sodom and Gomorrah." But then, between the time that my Uncle Jimmy preached that sermon and the time that I preached this sermon today, there was a tablet found that mentioned it was in a different city. It wasn't in the direct area. It was in a different city. But there was a tablet that was had a list of the different cities of the ancient world. And it was from this time period, time period of Abraham, and sure enough, one of the cities there was Sodom. So we have historical, archaeological evidence that Sodom existed. That there was a place called Sodom. But they've scoured the area over there and they have found no traces. There's no walls. There's no 
pot shards, there's no coins or anything like that. It's just, it's barren. When God destroys a city, He gets it done thoroughly and utterly. And now we come to, in verse 26, probably the most, I hate to say, but it's probably one of the most tragic verses in the entire Old Testament. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife looked back. I want everyone to take notice of a few Bible passages. Notice what Jesus said in Luke 9, 61. And in 61 and 62 rather. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We don't know exactly why Lot's wife looked back. We just know that she did. We sang the song this morning, Count Your Blessings. Rather than count her blessings that she made it out of the city, that she escaped that thorough destruction, rather than count the blessings that her husband made it out to and that her two daughters made it out, Rather than count her many blessings, she looked back. As to why she looked back, that that's kind of up to speculation. But knowing we can kind of maybe get a clue just from looking at human nature. Maybe she looked back because the city, while evil offered her all her carnal desires to be fulfilled. Pretty clothes, fine jewelry, maybe a big house. But in Mark 8, 36 and 37, when Jesus poses the question, what will someone give in exchange for their soul? Maybe she looked back because that she missed her family and friends. That's entirely possible that she looked back because of her sons-in-law. Maybe she loved her sons-in-law. But notice what Jesus says in Luke 14.26. That if you love your family and friends more than you love Him, you are not worthy of following Him. You cannot be His disciple if you love your family more than you love God. Maybe it was familiarity. Many people fall back on things that are bad simply because they are familiar rather than go into the unknown. Many cases have been shown where abusers will, will abuse the people who are abused rather will return to their abusers not because that they love not necessarily because that they love them, not necessarily because that they like being abused, but it's because it's familiar. They say that men will often marry their mothers while daughters will marry their fathers, and it's because that they see certain qualities that are familiar to them. But as far as falling back into an evil familiar, and now, as far as, as far as marrying someone based off good qualities, good familiar qualities, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong there. I want to say that. But when we think about the evil familiar, look at what Moses did. Hebrews 11, 24-27, it says that he, would rather, that he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses 
could have fallen back into the familiar of being in Pharaoh's house. He, you've got to remember, he grew up in Pharaoh's house. He knew the corridors. He knew the halls. He knew how that they worship. He, he could have gone back to that familiar. But he rather would suffer affliction with God's people. Why like why Lot's wife looked back, we don't know, but for whatever reason she did. And she became a pillar of salt. Another casualty in Lot's family, along with his sons in law, in the destruction of Sodom. Along with all those people. But what it boils down to is this. It boils down to this. That we are not promised today. You see, Lot, he had an advantage. The angels came and they told him, you get out of the city. Because once you've gotten out of the city and you're in Zoar, God's going to destroy you. He's going to destroy the city of Sodom. So Lot knew how long he had. We don't know how long that we had. And just as the angels, messengers from God came to Lot and warned him, get out of the city. God has messengers today. And His messengers today are preachers. And it is their duty to preach the Gospel. To send out the message that God has not promised you a day. Destruction is coming. You've, not, you've got to get out of sin. And the message that is heard, the Gospel, good news. It's good news because it gives you a chance to do something about it. Romans 10, 17, it produces faith. And we have to believe that Christ is the Messiah. John 8, 24. We leave the familiarity of sin not looking back. Acts 17.30 That is repentance. Professing allegiance to Christ. Romans 10.9 and 10 And being buried with Him in baptism. Rising to walk in newness of life. Romans 6.3 and 4 And continuing to walk in the light. Ephesians 5.8 Now thankfully... We don't have a situation like Lot's wife where if you look back, you turn into a pillar of salt. But if you do look back, you've got to repent and seek forget and ask for forgiveness as Simon did. Return walking to the right path. Acts 8.22 If you spend too much time looking back, then you could die in your sin. If anyone has need to respond to the Lord's invitation to get out of town, get out of sin, to come back to the right path, we beg with you, we plead with you, don't join the ranks, don't join the ranks of those who fell in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's sons-in-law, or his wife. Please respond to the Lord's invitation if you need to do so while the rest of us stand and sing.